Okay, so happy Wednesday. Thank you all for joining us this evening as we crest the midpoint of National Volunteer Week. This is our second annual National Volunteer Week Voice of Volunteerism event. My name is Arlene Medeiros, your host, and I am a volunteer services recruitment team member volunteer with the American Red Cross of Northern New England. I am a recent resident of Hampton, New Hampshire. I am also a fairly new volunteer with the Red Cross. And I'm excited to be your host as volunteerism is important to me and the entire Red Cross team. And it must be important to you because you're here tonight. So thank you in advance. Um, I look forward to the hour ahead for all of us. So of course, some housekeeping things uh, before we go too far. You've joined us on Microsoft Teams. If you don't know uh, and haven't used it, if you move your cursor around your screen, you'll find the floating bar that allows you to toggle on and off your microphone, camera, and raise your hand with um, icons or share a reaction, and it will also open a chat window. And again, tonight we're, we are recording the session, so by using your camera, you do consent to being recorded. And we encourage all participants to use the chat box if you have any questions throughout the presentations. Um, just make sure that as you're, if you type that you're still muted um, after the fact in case you get kicked off for by typing. And we'll be answering those questions once we've heard from all of our wonderful guests this evening. We ask that only those hosting or participating as panelists come off mute prior to the question and answer portion to minimize the background noise and feedback we get, as you all know, from online meetings. Additionally, tonight for all participants, we will be gifting a Red Cross first aid kit. At the end of our presentation, we will enter you we will enter a survey link into the chat where you can submit your feedback and information to receive your kit. It's just a small way to say thank you and encourage you to be safe and prepared while out and about in your volunteer community, um, volunteering or not. Um, and while the slide shows April 23rd as the date for that survey to be done, that doesn't mean that um, you can't volunteer if you just uh, sign up by then. So as we kick off this evening, we, have, we wanted to share the statement from Points of Light, and I quote, National Volunteer Week is an opportunity to recognize the impact of volunteer service and the power of volunteers to tackle society's greatest challenges, to build stronger communities, and be a force that transforms the world. Each year, we shine a light on the people and causes that inspire us to serve, recognizing and thanking volunteers who lend their time, talent, and voice to make a difference in their communities. End quote. Vol National Volunteer Week was established in 1974 and has grown exponentially each year with thousands of volunteer projects and special events scheduled throughout the week. Today, as people strive to lead their lives that reflect their values, the expression of civic life, life has evolved. Whether online, at the office, or at the local food bank, whether with a vote, a voice, or a wallet, Doing good comes in many forms, and we recognize and celebrate them all. End of the quote. Tonight, we have come together to do just that. Tonight, we won't only hear about how volunteers make a difference with the Red American Red Cross and how you can get involved, but we will hear from our regional CEO and three of our beloved volunteers who are an essential part of our story here in Northern New England. I am honored to take a moment to introduce Stephanie Coutier or from Northern New England CEO. Stephanie is the Chief Executive Officer for the American Red Cross of Northern New England as of October 2020. In this role, she oversees Red Cross services in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Stephanie has served the American Red Cross mission since 2011. She is a skilled professional with over 15 years of direct nonprofit community relations, fundraising, and event planning experience throughout Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Stephanie attended Southern 
New Hampshire University to pursue both her undergraduate and graduate degrees, receiving a Master of Science degree in organizational leadership. Stephanie lives in Stratford, New Hampshire with her husband and three daughters. But regretfully, Stephanie could not be with us tonight. One of her children has a school function she needed to attend. But if you have met Stephanie, then you know she is here with us in spirit to celebrate tonight. However, in her place, she has recorded a few words for us tonight. I really appreciate those remarks because they are perfect in setting in setting the stage for our evening tonight. So let's rewind and start at the very beginning, our mission. The American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. To achieve this mission, we have divided our program delivery into five lines of service that make up our one Red Cross. These lines of service are our training services. Trainings and preparedness education are key facets to this branch of the organization. In an effort to help save lives and strengthen communities, the American Red Cross has a history of providing opportunities to be trained in many of the most useful life skills from first aid and adult child CPR and AED automated automated external defibrillator to swimming, lifeguarding, babysitting, and more. These trainings hope to enable those certified to prevent, prepare for, and respond in a number of life-threatening scenarios. Next is biomedical services, one of the most well-known of our five lines of services. The Red Cross Blood Services Branch provides a life-saving supply of blood to 3,000 different hospitals, transfusion centers, and medical facilities every single day. We are the United States' largest single supplier of blood and blood products, collecting 6.5 million units of blood annually. In order to maintain a supply that meets the demands of patients in need, the Red Cross relies on blood donation centers in addition to blood drives held on a regular basis throughout the region. Another of the most um, well-known publicly recognizable line of services is disaster services. From large-scale disasters such as hurricanes and floods to local home fires, the Red Cross has always been there to help individuals and families cope in times of need. Disaster relief focuses not only on the most urgent disaster response efforts, but prevention and preparedness as well. On any given day when a disaster strikes, disaster action teams and local caseworkers are deployed on site, stationed at shelters and on standby in their communities to help those affected receive the food, care, and basic resources they need to recover. Next is the services to the armed forces. This branch of the American Red Cross focuses on active service members, veterans, and their families 
The Red Cross is responsible for providing various humanitarian services and resources to over 1 million active duty personnel and over 1 million members of the National Guard and Reserves. These services are available across the United States and in military installations around the world. Additionally, emergency communication services play a central role in uniting families with their military members. And lastly, international services. By partnering with over 180 other National Red Cross and Red Crescent societies through emergency health services and external disaster response, we strengthen leadership, financial management, volunteer networks, and support the global movement. International humanitarian law education continues to allow youth volunteers here in the U.S a place to explore the Geneva Conventions and human rights through the lens of limits on warfare. In addition, the Restoring Family Links program helps reunite families and loved ones who have been separated due to international conflict. With this overview complete, let's move to our guests who are essential in allowing us to provide these services. If you did not already know, our workforce is about 90% volunteer based. We simply could not be successful without volunteers. So tonight, we are very excited to have Mark, Phyllis, and Bill with us representing the Northern New England region. Among all of our presenters this evening, we collectively bring over 22 years of Red Cross experience. Tonight, we have tasked our guests with telling us their Red Cross story. You'll hear a variety of remarks that may include how they came upon the Red Cross, why they serve, and why they stick around. Let's give our full attention to their stories and the services that they provide to the community. We encourage your questions and we'll take a quick pause after each speaker, but only so that you can put your questions that you might have for each speaker in the chat. And I would ask that if you have a question that's specific to the speaker, to at least put their name at the front of your question so that that person can uh, personally answer your question during the question and answer period. Panelists, a friendly reminder to keep your eye on the clock and uh, Erica will be flashing the one minute warning just in case. We want to ensure everyone has um, time to share what they brought and as well for audience members. So first to the stage is Mark Critz. Mark has been with us for about four years since 2018. He lives in Londonderry, New Hampshire. And a fun fact is that Mark's wife Sue also volunteers with us and they are definitely a power couple. I will pass the mic to Mark to share his Red Cross story. Thank you, Arlene, and good evening, everybody. Nice to see all of you on the different little bubbles that I can see here. So my name is Mark. As Arlene mentioned, I've been a volunteer since May of 2018. I am the Northern New England or NNE logistics facilities lead. And in that role, I'm responsible for doing shelter surveys and facility use agreements in all three of the states. Here's another Red Cross acronym RAST, which is the regional application support team. I'm the local expert for the software that is used to store all of the data for the shelters. I'm a disaster action team responder here in Southern New Hampshire. I regularly sign up for shifts and go out uh, mostly with my wife, who is a supervisor in that area. I'm an instructor, specifically an advanced instructor, which means I can teach the uh, more difficult upper level courses. I'm also certified to teach forklifts if anybody needs to get certified. And Another Red Cross acronym for those of you that aren't in the Red Cross is GAPS, which is Group Activity Position. Think of it like a job description, and I have manager GAPS in both in a logistics field and also in what's called operations management, which I'll talk about a little more later. Thanks, Arlene. You can move to the next slide. 
So one of the questions is, how did I get involved with the Red Cross? Uh, I retired from the auto industry about 17 years ago, and I had a just a wealth of logistics experience. I later ran my own manufacturing consulting company for another 10 years. So in my, my world, logistics is part of my DNA. I did do quite a bit of volunteering for Dean Kamen's New Hampshire uh, robotic uh, nonprofit, but I didn't do very much logistics there, and I kind of missed the logistics end, although I liked the engineering end on the robotics. So volunteering for the Red Cross where I could use my logistics was very appealing to me. And as uh, was mentioned, my wife had already been a volunteer for a few years, and I was able to uh, get into the system through her. Okay, Arlene. So the question that comes up is what keeps me volunteering? And going on the DAT or disaster action team calls to help clients throughout one of the worst days of their lives is important to me. There's definitely an opportunity as a volunteer to grow into supervisor and manager roles, which then will later get you to be able to deploy. I really enjoy teaching, especially classes in logistics or management. Uh, it's an opportunity for divisional and national level deployments, and I've got some pictures of those coming up in a bit. One thing I really enjoy is mentoring the next wave of volunteers who came in behind me to grow into positions utilizing their specific skill set. Uh, one of the roles that I have is I'm on the Northern New England leadership team, uh, so I attend the leadership meeting every Monday morning and am part of the heartbeat of the organization. I also work on a national team that's developing the next generation of the national shelter system. So I'm involved both locally, divisionally, and nationally, and it keeps me busy. Okay. So there's going to be a series of slides, and the, the theme on all of them here is what keeps me volunteering, and each one has a little different twist. This first one has to do with national deployments, and these three very happy ladies that you see in the picture here worked for a dog shelter in Fatville, North Carolina, and what happens after shelters are finished and closed up, uh, logistics ends up having to get rid of all the blankets that are there. And one of the places that we find that loves blankets are dog, dog shelters. And these ladies just, I delivered two uh, cargo vans full of blankets to them, which they said would last them for a year. They were very, very happy people. So go ahead to the next slide. On that same deployment, uh, one day I was tasked with taking cots down to a Baptist church down near the Cape Fear River, which people have probably heard about the Cape Fear River before from movies. And I had to drive through an area that had been very significantly flooded. And doing that, I realized that the work that we do is very important to all these clients. The, these people's lives was out on the street waiting to be picked up. So it's a site you don't get to see very often up here in the Northeast but down in North Carolina, it happens semi-regularly. Go ahead, next. I did a national deployment in Oregon a couple of years ago, and on the first day I was there, I was driving down to the district, and I was asked to stop into a church, and I was expecting not that much. It was just supposed to be a church, and they had a giant tent set up. There were multiple 53 foot trailers there with rakes and shovels and supplies and meals and water. And the one thing that really hit me being from the East Coast is what are called sifter boxes. And in the right hand picture, you can see a whole great big stack of them that come out of our warehouses and are also donated by people in the local area. And what these are used for is for people after the fire has gone through where their house used to be, they go through with the shovel that we give them and the rake and then put the materials in the sifter boxes and sift to look for memories. So it was pretty moving to me to see that. I'd never seen that before here on our side of the coast. Next. One of the other things, I, the primary uh, position that I deploy in is in facilities, and then part of facilities is finding warehouses. And also on that Oregon deployment, 
on the way down, I stopped at. They didn't have a warehouse, so they were they had parked all the tractor trailers at a uh, county uh, fairgrounds. And the trucks were all sitting out there. It was very warm, very dry, dusty. And we had three or four forklift operators working in the dust every day. So the first thing that I had to do was uh, find a warehouse. We did that and this picture was taken the night. The first night when I was there with the first trailer moved. Go ahead, next one. Another real quick, I did a deployment in operations management. You can see the temperatures on the screen. I was uh, with a team of 25 people who were getting ready to be deployed out to cover shelters that were there for the heat. Next. Light, local volunteer, volunteering. This is at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway. I volunteered there twice. Go ahead. Another thing is working with partners, in this case, a Bud Light truck delivering water, not Bud Light, to our warehouse in Oregon. Here locally, we have Crystal Geyser, Coca-Cola, and Budweiser all support us in our region. Go ahead. Another is really important to me is supporting our Red Cross volunteers. I pre-deployed in South Carolina before the hurricane. We had all these emergency response vehicles, and within about three hours, we had a shelter set up for them for the night. Go ahead. Another is training. I spent my entire career in the auto industry and I never drove a forklift in my entire career. In the Red Cross, I was trained to be able to do that. And the day after this picture was taken, I deployed to North Carolina in the warehouse. So next. Uh, the other thing in our region, we have about 1200 shelters and they're not all in high schools. Just real quick, uh, we're in a YMCA up in Maine, A City Auditorium in Barrie, Vermont, and I just did a survey in American Legion Post here in New Hampshire last week. Go ahead. Most importantly, when we do deploy is to take a day off, and this was on my 2020 deployment in Oregon. I had always wanted to go to Crater Lake, and I got to go there. So that's my story, and that's why I enjoy being a volunteer. Thank you. Mark, what a great story of volunteerism. I'm excited to see what questions anyone might have for him. So if you have a specific question for Mark, um, you can please put it in the chat now. And uh, during our question and answer portion, we're going to um, address those questions. And we're going to thank you in advance for those questions because his career has been vast within the Red Cross and um, it does point to the training services um, and all the different possibilities um, that you can have as a volunteer. Thank you, Mark. And now next to the virtual stage is Phyllis Arnold Rand. Phyllis has been with us for 13 years. She lives in Lewiston, Maine, and I'm going to now pass the mic over to her so she can share her story. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I work at the Greater Augusta Utility District, which is a drinking water, wastewater treatment, and stormwater utility in Augusta, Maine. Uh, as you can see by the photos, I'm in charge of the laboratory. Um, I'm currently working on a special project with a lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, to detect trends in COVID cases based on the detection of COVID genetic material in wastewater. I also teach safety classes and uh, wastewater operator classes for staff members who want to sit for their certification exams. Uh, I've been in the wastewater treatment profession for 33 years. Next slide, please. So why did I join the Red Cross? Next slide, please. I grew up the youngest of six children in a military family. Here, in the, here we are in the middle photo. Uh, my sister Betty was taking the photo, so um, that's why you only see five children. Uh, I'm the little bratty looking one with the two ponytails. And uh, I have to say my mother was wearing that hat. Um, so 13 years ago, I was looking for a nonprofit organization to volunteer with 
and told my mother I was having a hard time uh, choosing from among, among so many good uh, organizations. And then she told me the story about a time when my father was serving his second tour of duty in Vietnam. Uh, we had, in the meantime, we moved to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, at Fort Bragg, we encountered some very serious financial hardships due to army red tape. And so my mother, who didn't know anybody, sought help from organizations that aid military families, but nobody would help us. Somebody suggested she contact the American Red Cross. She did that. And the Red Cross got an emergency message to my father in Vietnam. And then my father went to his commanding officer. As those of you with the military background know, commanding officers have a special way of encouraging staff to make things happen. Well, that that very thing happened. The red tape was was taken care of, and um, we were able to get on our feet. So when I heard that story, I knew this was my chance to repay the Red Cross for helping my family, and so that's why I joined the Red Cross. Next slide, please. Uh, so current, currently, as a government operations manager, I manage and work with volunteers who serve as Red Cross liaisons to local, county, state, federal, and tribal governmental agencies during disasters. I'm getting more involved with my local community as a Red Cross community volunteer leader. In the past, I served in service to armed forces when I volunteered at a military hospital. Last October, I successfully donated blood for the first time. After that first donation, the Red Cross notified me that my blood had a special characteristic that made it compatible for people who suffer from sickle cell disease, which is a disease that predominantly affects people of African descent. Uh, that information uh, energized me, and so I decided to run my first blood drive this coming Juneteenth holiday um, with a special emphasis on recruiting blood donors of African descent. Uh, I'm both excited and nervous, but I have a lot of support. And I want to emphasize that this blood drive is open to all donors. Next slide, please. So volunteering for the Red Cross can have many facets. An important and vital characteristic of a Red Cross is to always be flexible, simper gumby. You may be participating in a full-scale disaster exercise one day, being interviewed by a television station another day, you may be deployed to a disaster on the other side of the country or handing out cleaning supplies after a hurricane, sleeping on a cot in a staff shelter, or marching in a parade. Uh, the important thing is with disasters, whether local or national, large or small, the situations can change quickly. Be flexible, keep calm, and remember you're not alone. Next slide, please. So I deployed to the bootleg fire disaster relief operation in mid, um, in mid July, 2021. The fire burned more than 400,000 acres and um, in um, Oregon and 100%, it reached 100% containment in mid August. That means it was still burning, but at least it wasn't spreading. Uh, my photo, shows a typical scene as I drove from where I was working out of the incident command post to where I stayed at night. Next slide, please. I worked from one of two incident command posts where I provided daily updates on Red Cross sheltering, feeding, and our other mass care activities in the affected communities. Uh, a typical meeting agenda is on the right. The meetings were broadcast at two incident command posts which is why there's a camera in front of me and a video screen to my right. I found the fire behavior information reports really interesting. Next slide, please. So volunteers don't generally seek recognition, but every now and then it's nice to be shown appreciation like with this week's uh, volunteer week activities. 
In Maine, volunteers from all over the state, not just Red Crossers, who have logged in 500 or more volunteer hours get added to Maine's annual volunteer wall of honor. We receive a pin, our names are publicized in the date Bangor Daily News and on the state website. We receive a ticket to the Maine Sea Dogs game, baseball game, and a few other goodies. Last year, I was surprised and honored to receive a letter of appreciation and a gold volunteer service award from the White House. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So volunteers often volunteer for more than one organization. These are a few of mine. In 2014, I was on a 50-mile bicycle um, ride to raise money for the Dempsey Center for Cancer, Hope, and Healing, and I encountered Patrick Dempsey, Dr. McDreamy from Gray's Anatomy himself, and I asked and he took a picture with me. He's the only bicyclist I know who wears cologne on a bicycle ride, by the way. Next slide, please. So why I continue volunteering with the Red Cross. Next slide, please. Because I believe in the mission of the American Red Cross, and I believe in the fundamental principles of the American Red Cross. Next slide, please. So in closing, I wanna thank you for your volunteerism or your future volunteerism. Remember Semper Gumby, and thank you, and have a happy Volunteer Week. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. All I can say is, wow, when I first looked at this presentation and saw the scope of both your and Mark's uh, experiences within the Red Cross, that's all I could say was, wow. It's awe-inspiring learning about your robust Red Cross experiences. Um, and if you have any questions specific to Phyllis, now would be a good time to put them in the chat with her name so that we know they're for her. And if you have any general questions, certainly just pop those in there too so we can look at them through the question and answer period. What, what might be on your mind about their services? Um, add those questions and we'll be circling back soon. So last but certainly not least is Bill Sanderson. Bill has been with us for five years and lives in Burlington, Vermont. Bill is a weekly pillar in our Burlington, Vermont Blood Center. And if you happen to be a frequent blood donor at that site, you have most likely met him. We will now pass the mic to Bill to share his story. Well, I don't have any, um, you know, slides like Mark and Phyllis did at all, um, any pictures or anything like that. So I'm just going to tell you, um, I've been with the Red Cross now for the almost five years now um, in Burlington. And what my position is, when I first started out, you know, why did I join the Red Cross? Well, I joined the Red Cross because in the past I donated blood um, there and I figured, well, you know, where do I want to go to volunteer? So I went down to the Red Cross and to you know see what they had for volunteer positions. And um, I met with Alice Drizlane, which is the head uh, volunteer coordinator um, at the Red Cross. And um, I you know ended up filling out, um, went online to fill out what positions I wanted to uh, do. And um, so I went to another Red Cross uh, thing and then I went back and they had a uh, positions available for the canteen at the main plant and also um, donor ambassador uh, position so i started out as a canteen person working in the canteen so that, that consists of the canteen is where donors would go after they're done donating platelets and donating blood they would come over and they would sit down and there's a basket that's full of snacks and you know you could ask them if they wanted anything to drink and at the time um, we were able to serve we had you know serve juice which we still do serve water which we still do um and we also were able to serve coffee um hot chocolate and hot tea which right now we cannot um serve right now because of the um the pandemic and everything because of covid um and so we would ask them if they want anything to drink or cold to drink and um, they would ask us and you know and we would get that for them 
and um, you know, and we talk to them also of what their experience is, um, you know, of donating platelets or blood, um, which was really nice. And it's heartwarming to hear some of their stories, why they donate actually, um, you know, why they donate blood or why they donate platelets. And it's nice hearing some of their stories. So back then, you know, we would have a, a list on that Atlas would print out of what days, you know, people would, you know, come in um you know to uh volunteer at the main you know the main building in burlington you know the month the days and the date and we could actually fill in our name if it was uh, was it already filled in and we could, or tell them ahead of time what you know what days we wanted to volunteer and um that would happen and then i ended up moving to another position which is the, the ambassador position which is when people come in, um, what's changed in that position when I first volunteered is when I first came in 2017, uh, that's when I first started, you know, uh, volunteering actually was June of 2017, is the ambassador is when they come in, we would ask them, you know, did they did you have an appointment? And they would say, yes, we do. We would check the list of names who, you know, who had appointments. We'd highlight it. And what they had back then is they would have a little plastic thing on our desk, two plastic. Um, uh, they would have a plastic thing and it had two slots. One slot was for platelets. Another slot was for blood and um, double red, which was called back then, which they call now power red. And what they would do is if somebody had a platelet appointment, we would say, do you have a donor card or an ID? And they would say yes. So what we would do is we'd take their donor card or ID, would put it in one slot, and then you would say, all right, you can go sit over where the people would sit actually, where they, you know, where until they got sought, you know, until they got ended up seeing by staff. Um, there's a place over in the in the in the main building where people could actually sit down when they came in we'd show them where to sit down and over there they would be you know there'd be water you know there would be snacks and i would tell them i'd say you're welcome to have anything to snack on or drink when you're waiting and they'd say okay and if the and then the next person would come in they were donating blood they would actually come in we'd ask for the same thing do you have a donor card or an id do you have an appointment and they would say yes or no. If they didn't have an appointment, you know, either platelets or blood, then we would have to ask staff. There would be some days where they would say, yes, we can accept, um, ended up accepting, you know, walk-ins. And it said, say, some days it'd be no. Um, if it was no, then we'd say, sorry, you know, you can't, um, you know, we can't accept your appointment today. You know, can you make another appointment, you know, and uh, they can make an appointment right there um at the at the main building there was a person there that could actually make appointments or we would tell them to call 1-800 red cross you know to reschedule your appointment if they did accept the point if they did accept walk-ins or if they did have an appointment then we would um say do you have a donor card um and then we would say do you have a donor card or an id they'd say yes what we do is we'd have a, a name tag which means there was a green one, which means they're first time donors. There's a red one, which means they're donating cold blood. And then there's a another red one with a, um, a blood thing down bottom where it says uh, double red, which was called back then. And um, if they were a first time person, they would only be able to accept only, you know, donate blood because, you know, they never donated blood at all before. Um, so we'd give them a green one. If they already donated blood, they would give them a red one. Um, and if they want to do power red, you'd have to have an appointment actually to, to donate um, to that actually. So what we do, get back to what I was saying, if they were doing the whole blood um, back then, they would actually fill out in the, um, the card. They'd put their name on the card, the red um, name tag. We'd ask for a donor card. We'd ask for an ID. Then what we'd do is we'd, we'd take a paper clip, attach the name plus the, the uh, donor card or the ID, and we'd put it in the slot, um, the other slot, which would be for blood and only, you know, double red only. And then if a person, another person came in that was donating blood or power red, they would go behind that person 
And then what the staff would do is they would come up and they would, you know, grab the person that was up front, you know, that's been waiting the longest for either platelets or, you know, donating blood or power red. So what happened was as time went on, I don't know if it was 2018 or 19, then it came out with a computer where people that were coming in could actually do it remotely. Um, they got rid of the um, thing where we didn't have to ask for, um, you know, we didn't have to, you know, end up attaching a, you know, a um, donor card or an ID, you know, when if they're donating blood or platelets, we didn't have to put it in a slot. So what that is now is when they come in, um, we ask them, do you want to donate? You know, do you have an appointment? And we tap the screen and on the screen, they would say, do you have a donor card? Do you have an ID um, or a driver's license? And they would hit the screen and they would say, you know, donor card or an id you know they would then what they would do is they'd scan it we have a little scanner underneath they would put their card underneath it and automatically scan it it'd say you know do you have an appointment and if it does it say their name the appointment they hit yes and it'd say do you did, did you do rapid pass well the rapid pass is where if you didn't you know it has all kinds of different questions health questions you could actually do in your own home which I'm sorry I didn't mention back then. You know, we did, you know, as I when I volunteered, they still had rapid pass. Um, hey Bill, we we are at time, but I, I hate to cut you off because rapid pass is actually really cool, and I know you were going to get into it. Yeah. Um, is there any? Do you have a closing statement or anything before we move on? And this this was so cool to hear about the process. Okay. Um. So I'm sorry. So what happens is, you know, if they didn't have any, you know, if they didn't do the rapid pass or whatever they have, we have the, you know, health information that they can actually do it. And if they can answer the rest of the questions, um, they can do that, you know? So in closing, why do I volunteer? I volunteer because it's, it's, I, I enjoy what I do, you know, for work. I enjoy helping people hearing their stories and what my position does and, um, everything else. Um, so that's why I volunteer and enjoy, you know, helping out as much as I can with the staff and um, doing what I do, you know, there as well. And I really enjoy um, hearing other people's stories, you know, Mark and Phyllis's stories and what they, why they volunteer. And um, if you ever do want to volunteer for people that are here that never volunteered, get in contact with your volunteer coordinator. You can either do volunteering like I do for my position or what do, or Mark does and Phyllis does and uh, you can either go online and um, you know get that information or meet your you know volunteer you know person volunteer coordinator um so and thanks for all the people that do volunteer and, and hearing your stories today and you know congratulations to all of you for what you do and uh, vo happy volunteer week well thank you, thank thank you bill thanks um, thank you for sharing your story with us because it's very interesting to know about the process. Um, and it's always a privilege to have you in the Burlington Blood Center. You're an important part of that team. And I already saw that some people have questions that they've put in the chat, so that's awesome. We're going to um, be in our question and answer period shortly, so you can keep putting those questions in for Bill. And so I'm going to thank you in advance for all those people that already um, put in some questions. What I love about these stories is that they are all very different and they're different from even my own. We all come to volunteerism for different reasons and with different intentions. And along um, the way, we run into similarities, but our stories really are our own. For anyone in the audience who has thought about volunteering who's not already with the Red Cross, or if you're even thinking about another local organization, we encourage you to give it a try. These volunteers did, I did too. And now we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. You can tell from each of the speakers, and I hope you can tell from my own speaking, that we are very excited to be part of the Red Cross. The impact of our volunteer time and talents has a far-reaching, rippling effect on our communities, 
regions and country. And so how do you get involved? You sign up, like Bill said, go to redcross.org slash volunteer. You're not already a volunteer. And you're gonna fill out the online application. They will um, have a, a background check. Yes, we do need a background check because there are so many different volunteer positions in the Northern New England region. And if you're outside of the region, well, you could still sign up at Red Cross through, through that link for your own region. And so they complete the volunteer profile, and then that takes you through the application process and the background check. Now think about it. Um, Red Cross, we're dealing with people's lives in very dire straits and situations and with very sensitive populations. So you can imagine that we would want to know who is volunteering with us. After that, you'll talk with the local screening team, a team of volunteers who will help place you in the right volunteer role based on your interests and skill set, which I found personally to be amazing because I was I went in saying, you know, whatever you need, that's what I'll do. But they were like, no, let's see what you have and see if we can find the perfect fit. And here I am, and I think it's perfect. <laughs> so they'll find a place for you and they'll start the training process for whatever role you'll begin in. As you heard from Mark, and I'm sure Phyllis has already done many trainings too, that Red Cross is very great about giving the kind of training you need so that you can be successful and right from the start. And even if you aren't interested tonight, but if you know someone, if you're already a volunteer who might be interested, please share this intro with them and the link because you never know what people might want to be doing because what's that saying? If, if you are asked, you probably will do it. But if you're not asked, you don't even know that you want to. So now um, we'll be giving out more specific contact information at our question after our question and answer segment, which is next. Awesome. So, ahead, yeah. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for participating, for staying with us, especially our panelists. And there are a couple more slides, but we're going to look at the questions from the audience. Um, and I know that there were a bunch and um, we'll ask the specific guests to pop on or off mute as needed. Yeah, awesome. So we do still have some questions in the chat. We have put some responses in there. I know Mark and Phyllis, you um, have been answering those along the way as well, but we have a few and we have perfect amount of time to answer those. So first, Mark, I have a couple of questions for you that are floating in the chat box. So um, a great question that Logan asked, do you have any key tips for volunteers going out on their first deployment? I'm sure that can be kind of a, um, a, you know, challenging situation going out there for the first time. So any tips? Uh, number one is patience, because it sometimes takes a little while to get checked in and you really want to get to work when you get there. Uh, the other thing that I would say is volunteer to do things when you're there. Like if you're assigned a specific role and you don't have anything to do, Go to your supervisor, go to other people that you know there and see if you can't do something else. It makes the day go by. It's much more enjoyable to stay busy. I had there was another question about uh, helmets not required or helmets on the forklift in the picture. So I have not been in a Red Cross facility yet, and I am an instructor for forklift training. We do not require helmets on forklifts. We absolutely require seat belts, which you saw I had on in that picture, but we do not require do not require helmets. Any safety equipment that is needed is supplied, especially in the warehouse situation. I think I got the two that you were going to ask me. You sure did. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Um, and Barbara, you had a great question as well. So Barbara asked, do you have to know much about blood medically or scientifically to volunteer to help at blood drives? Um, answer there, Barbara, is no. We provide all the training you need. Um, Bill, do you feel that you have to have a lot of kind of understanding of blood to be a blood donor ambassador? Oh, what was the question again? I'm sorry. 
do you have to know a lot about blood or is or is it kind of you you learn on site which well, you, you can know? you can actually you know we've been actually been training you know uh people you know if they come in you, you know we can actually just tell them you know what they need to do for you know you know what they can do for ambassador and uh what they can do you know if, if they work in the canteen and everything else um for right now what people do is they mostly when they do when they come in now they mostly just cover you know both positions you know you don't have to i don't you don't have to have any really experience at all to to do with an ambassador or you know to do the you know the canteen as far as i know at all awesome yeah um perfect and then i just we don't have any other questions remaining questions but in the chat um steve had a great comment about how Phyllis has, has done a lot with the organization. And he was wondering how you tend to kind of get involved in other lines of service. And I just wanted to share Phyllis's response because I think it can be really helpful for a lot of volunteers, depending on what you do with the Red Cross. And Phyllis shares that she keeps her eyes and ears open for interesting opportunities. Um, and that includes requests for volunteers for certain tasks. So if we have an event coming up or something fun that you can get involved in on the side in addition to your role, it's a great chance to learn about another line of service, get to know other volunteers, and maybe get sucked into a whole new role. Um, so I just wanted to share that, and I don't believe we have any other questions. So thank you all so much. We have a couple more things before we wrap up, so I think we'll be right on time tonight. So very excited about that. Actually, actually I just got a question, actually. I'm sorry. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. I have a question for both Mark and Phyllis. My first question is um, to both of you. My first one is actually during the COVID situation, um, were you guys able to still do your positions? And what was, was there anything that changed, you know, during the first time when you guys don't uh, volunteered it right up until the COVID? And my second question is, is do you guys have any, you know, how much longer do you think you guys will do more volunteering? Do you, do you keep on, you, you know, do you have a certain deadline when you're going to stop volunteering or do you gonna keep doing it as long as you actually can? We'll do a lightning round, but those are those are great questions, Bill. Mark or Phyllis, you want to pick those up? I'll, I'll go first because it's hard for me to remember all those questions. So regarding COVID, during COVID, um, a lot of the uh, work that I did went virtual for um, responding to the State Emergency Operations Center here in Maine, went virtual. But when I went on deployment to Oregon last uh, July, we just took the proper precautions with the face mask and social distancing. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't a big burden, but um, the other other types of things like meetings and trainings and that sort of thing were virtual. As far as my volunteering schedule, um, I plan on retiring from my full time job. Uh, around this time next year. And if anything, I would like to do more with service to armed forces once I retire, because I would like to get back into the uh, the VA Medical Center because I really like that. I just didn't have, I just couldn't do everything I wanted to do because, because of the, the time schedule that the hospital had. Okay, so on the COVID question, it drastically affected our ability to do surveys because many of the schools wouldn't let us in. But we were still able to do about 50 surveys during the COVID period, which kind of boggled my mind that we actually got that many done. We always wore protective gear on deployments, exactly as Phyllis said, we wore PPE in the offices. Uh, there were rules on cars. You couldn't have as many people in the car. We the biggest advantage was that we got our own room, so we didn't have roommates, which to me was a huge plus, and I'm gonna miss when we come off of the COVID protocol. Um, personally, I think I've still got a few more years to go before I uh, turn it in. That's it. Thank you. Back over to you, uh, Arlene. You are on mute. Sorry, there was another question for Mark. Um, Mark, can people do logistics work without experience in it? Yeah. Cool. I, All right. I couldn't get off mute. Yes, the oh, answer is okay. yes. There's seven disciplines 
and I'll read Paula asked that question. I'll reach out to Paula directly and let her know that there's several of the logistics disciplines that we can train you up for, and then you can deploy in those. So the answer awesome. is yes. That's awesome. I, I'm, I am in awe of the amount of training that can happen in this organization. And I've only done a few modules and I'm looking forward to doing a whole bunch more myself. But as we wrap up tonight, I want to be sure you know how to contact us if you if you don't already. Um, and if there are any questions that we haven't been able to answer, then reach out to um, us. And by us, I mean Erica Soler and Paula Coyle. And this is their contact information. They are the volunteer recruitment specialists for um, Northern New England. And I want to personally thank our CEO, Stephanie, for kicking us off this evening with the recorded message, as well as our guest speakers, Mark, Phyllis, and Bill, who have shed light on some of the humanitarian services provided through the American Red Cross. What a varied bank of services those are. Thank you to all of you for attending and joining us this National Volunteer Week. We hope to see you in our region or helping in your own neighborhoods, wherever you are, and supporting your communities. And then, um, at this point, we want to make sure that you all receive a first aid kit so that you can um, practice safety in your communities. And Erica has now um, popped in a survey monkey form that you just have to fill it out and um, with your information and we'll get the kit in the mail to you. And um, again, thank you for all the volunteers past, present, and hopefully future. Whether you're down the street, across the country, or around the world, we sincerely appreciate you, especially this week, but every day. For current and paid volunteer staff, we hope to see you tomorrow night. Jeopardy is from 6 to 7, as this will be the final Northern New England event for National Volunteer Week. For everyone else, we hope to see you volunteering with us or within the community um, and have a great, safe, and wonderful evening and the rest of the week. And we send you off with a quick little uh, video of some of the 